Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you to a uh, brand new uh, video series that uh, our dear brother Anthony Rogers is going to share with us. It's about an interesting topic related to what is called Christ in the Psalms. And really, the way that uh, Anthony is going to expound on that is that to show us how David, in his Psalms, uh, almost use the model of the Torah, or at least it mimics the Torah, which is the five books of Moses, uh, one way or another, uh, uh, to reveal to us Christ. And obviously, I do not want to steal the thunder uh, from Anthony here, but this is kind of like a summary of what this whole thing is going to be all about. And really, uh, the idea of doing this series was uh, myself encouraging Anthony to expound on this because he is going to teach this topic. By the time you guys have watched this, he would have taught it already in our online conference. But in the conference, he has a limited time to try to survey uh, through all of these topics versus now we're going to have a, an expanded version of the teaching where people will enjoy an in-depth look at a number of passages and quotes and many other aspects of this particular topic that, in my view, is an extremely important topic theologically, and it should also encourage many of us to see Christ everywhere in the Bible, and in this case, in the Psalms of David. Brother Anthony, thank you so much, as always, for being here with us, and thank you, really, for uh, accepting the invitation, even though I realize it was a short notice for you, but it dawned on me that uh, it will be extremely helpful for you to expand uh, this teaching that you are going to give uh, in our conference. Uh, I speak about it in the future tense here because we will be doing this in about a month from now. We are recording it right now, meaning these series, but by the time people will watch this, the conference would have taken place. So, Anthony, welcome, and tell us a little bit more about this particular series. Yeah, thanks so much, Al. It's a delight to be back on with you, and all the more to talk about this. Anytime we can talk about Christ, it is a delight Indeed, uh, David comes to mind, referred to Jesus, his greater son, as the delightful one of the Psalms of Israel. And we'll see more about that as we go through this. But uh, yeah, you pretty much summed up what I want to talk about, which is the idea that the Psalter is not a haphazard collection of inspired Psalms. Now, unfortunately, a lot of Christians and others, even Jews, have followed much of post-Christian, even post-Talmudic scholarship, liberal scholarship, in thinking of the Psalms, well, those who are liberal aren't even thinking of them as inspired, much less prophetic and eschatological or messianic, but uh, even those that think of them as inspired will follow a wayward course that uh, was set into motion uh, sometime during the Middle Ages and after that with the rise of critical scholarship, uh, and, and thinking of the Psalms as sort of a haphazard collection. There's no organization, there's no shape, no flow, no plot to the Psalter, and if they think of Psalms at all being prophetic of the Messiah, it's a Psalm here or a Psalm there. But the fact of the matter is that the entire Psalter is properly viewed a book about the Messiah. It's a book that talks about him. It, in fact, is a book in which he himself is speaking, and uh, this is true from beginning to end. Now, I admit that there are times when we might stumble over something and wonder, how can this be about Jesus? But the fact is, this is how Jesus taught us to approach the Psalms. Remember, in Luke 24, Jesus said to the despairing disciples on the road to Emmaus, remember Jesus died, and for all they knew, he was still in the tomb, but he was walking alongside them. And he referred to them as dull or slow of heart to understand all that had been written of him. And he specifically says all that had been written of him in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Now, here Jesus referred to the three divisions of the Old Testament. The Psalms represent all those books that uh, don't fall into the first category of the law or the second category of the prophets, but they take their name from that first major uh, section, which is the, the Psalter. And he's telling them that the book is about him. Now, I want to give you a quote, Al, because this is remarkable. I mentioned that 
a lot of Christians fall short here in, in thinking that the Psalter uh, isn't through and through about Jesus, but maybe only here and there. But what's surprising is that uh, I'm going to quote this to you, and this is actually from a Jewish individual. His name was Andre Shiraki. He was a Jewish guy. He was actually a politician in Israel for a good number of years. And he had a surprisingly good insight into what the Psalms are all about. You're going to find this breathtaking. Listen, listen to what he says. This is on page one of his book. It was written in French. It says, this is more than a book. It's a living being who is speaking and speaking to you. A living being who suffers, who groans and dies, who comes to life again and sings. And all this at the very threshold of eternity. It takes you up and carries you away, you and all the centuries from the beginning until the end. Now, already that should strike you as remarkable. He's describing the Psalter. He's even personifying it. He's saying that in it, we have the representation of a living being who dies and comes to life again and sings for joy. Later in the book, he goes on to say this, the just man, the tzaddik, that's the term for the just or the righteous man, is in the center of the way of eternity. He's talking about the subject of the book, the one that the book is all about. He realizes the real order of the world and redeems in light the chaos unleashed by his fellow fallen creature, the prince of iniquity. The two figures correspond to each other like images in reverse caused by a hidden flaw in a prison. The one, in the innocence of being, is a bearer of life. The other incarnates a lie and spreads death abroad. And there are nearly a hundred names in the Psalter to designate the hero of light, the oppressed, the afflicted. These are all names that he's saying are given to this figure in the Psalter, the afflicted, the oppressed, the despised, the tramp, the humble, the poor man, the brokenhearted, the faithful, the wise, the one who trembles, the upright, the stranger, the alien to the world, the beggar, God's devotee, the one who keeps watch before God's countenance, who searches for God's blessing, for his light, the clear-sighted eye, the pure heart, the honest hand, herald of the word, performer of just deeds, the tree of life, rooted on the river bank of mighty waters, the strong and wise, heroic and detached, fecund and pure, clear-sighted and without self-will, dead certain of victory, yet all a tremble for it, lover of life, yet suffering the passion of death, exiled in gaping wounded flesh, dying from the violence of his suffering or of his ascetic combat, captive of that hope which pledges him to acts of redemption and therefore enemy of the abyss in which non-being sparkles. In time of combat, a voice saves him from the fires of the seducer and arms him with the invincible weapons of the word. He is ever preserver of the covenant, custodian of sworn statements, bearer of light, announcer of the Redeemer name at the frontiers, where shadow surrenders to the advent of reality. His place is there at the break of the new day, whither he has been led, all moorings broken in his true quest for justice and for truth. And there, in the rising dawn, is none other than the one who announces the lover and the beloved, the servant and the friend, the prophet and the eldest son, the Messiah. Wow. Now, Tell me, Al, that's not breathtaking. Uh, it is. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, at the end, if you didn't mention the term Messiah, if you would have asked me, who do you think he's talking about? I would have said Jesus. I mean, without even blinking an eye. Yeah, and isn't it remarkable? This this is a Jewish man who doesn't believe in Jesus. And here, I would say, he has a far more penetrating insight into the essence of the Psalter. Notice he's talking about the whole book. He's right. saying, this is what the book is all about. This book is about the, uh, the Messiah and the Messiah described in just this way, somebody dying and coming to life again and singing for joy. Now, it's remarkable to me that he sees this, but yet doesn't see, right? How does he not conclude from this that Jesus is the Messiah? That's right. That's right. It's amazing, indeed, and I pray for his soul. I hope uh, he did see the light uh, before he died, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, indeed. So be before we conclude, uh, I wanted to start with that, but I, I want to set things up. I want people to see uh, something of where we're going with this, and it'll help uh, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, 
encapsulate or or provide something of a structure to what we're going to look at and what we just heard from Andre Shiraki. So the Psalter has a macro structure. It's not a disorganized collection. It has a deliberate structure. Right. If you look in your Bible at the beginning of Psalm 1, just before it, it actually has a note saying book one. Many mm -hmm. people don't know that the Psalter, the book of Psalms, is actually comprised of more than one book. That's right. right. So book one begins on with Psalm 1 and ends with Psalm 41. All right. Then you have book two, stretching from 42 to 72, book three, stretching from Psalm 73 to Psalm 89, and then book four from 90 to 106, and book five from Psalm 107 to 150. Now, what does that remind you of, Al? I know you know the answer to this. <laughs> well, this is, of course, the Torah, which is the five scrolls or the five books of Moses, but there is a deeper meaning here where you're headed also. Yeah, so when we when we think of a book that is also five books, the most natural thing that should come to mind and would have come to mind for any Jewish person is the Torah. And so, in fact, in many Jewish sources, they refer to the Psalter as the Torah of David or David's Torah. And what's interesting, and I'll say more about this in future episodes, is how this other Torah begins. In Psalm 1, it talks about a blessed man whose meditation day and night is the Torah of the Lord. That's right. So indeed, um, uh, you know, Anthony, people are going to see not only you have five books that mimic the Torah, but I'm certain you're going to start taking us book by book and how these also dig deeper into who is the Messiah and how is he represented in each one of them. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll do uh, a number of different things. But obviously, we can't cover it all. This is a study of a lifetime, really. But uh, there's a lot here. We'll we'll cover a good bit of stuff, and and uh, I'm hoping people are excited for it. And I'm hoping that we will keep on going with this series. Uh, we'll keep on adding to it, like I do this with Dr. J. Smith. We keep adding on something, and uh, this is uh, to me is even more important than just talking about Islam and the Quran and things of that nature, because this is the book of life indeed, and we need to learn from it. So thank you, brother, as always. And I hope people are excited now to join us next time. And even uh, beyond this point uh, to learn from this, I hope that you would use it to teach in your small groups. I hope that you will encourage others to dig deeper into uh, the Psalms and the structure of the Psalms that is intentional, many scholars believe. And what does it lead us into? Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi. Over and out. God bless.